Here we go. So today we are going to talk about fish. Last week we talked, uh, on Wednesday, we talked about farm pond management. Today we're going to talk about some other non-game fish and a few game fish. Uh, just a few more things to point out. Uh, we will not be having any more lab quizzes, but you will have one more lecture quiz next week. It'll be based on the lectures from this week. Uh, the last Wildlife Society meeting of the semester is happening on Wednesday of this week, so come to that. We're doing the parade on Thursday, so if you're interested in participating in that, make sure you're there for the meeting on Wednesday. All right, so we're going to talk about common fishes of western North Carolina streams today. This is a very limited list, uh, about 30, a little more than 30 species. Um and you don't need to know scientific names or orders or families, just no common names of these of these fish. Uh, they should all be fairly easy. Uh, but we are going to go through several of the darters, which are a little tougher. Uh, we're going to start with the order Petromyzontiformes. Again, you don't need to know the orders, just know the common names of the fish that we cover. Um, and these are the lampreys. They're eel-like, uh, but they're not actually eels. A lot of people confuse them with eels. Some of them are parasitic. And they'll attach to other fish with these crazy looking mouths. Um, and they'll stay there. They'll live their life on another, just literally attached to another fish. Uh, but others are not parasitic, like the mountain brook lamprey, the one we have here. It is not a, this is not a parasitic fish. Um, but they look like a lamprey. They look like they could be parasitic, but they're not. They're unique looking. Again, they're eel like. They have these circular uh, gills that look like little holes on the side of the head. Those are actually their gills. They have a sucker-like mouth, but they don't actually sucker on anything. Uh, again, this species is not parasitic, but other lampreys are. The adults of this species do not eat. So once they mature to adulthood, the species never eats again. They, leave off, they live off of the stored fat that they've uh, accumulated as juveniles. Uh, when they're juveniles, we call them amocetes, and they lack external eyes, and they remain buried in silt for three to six years before they emerge as an adult. So the first three to six years of their life, they're under the the silt or the substrate of whatever stream they're in. Um, and then once they emerge as an adult, they don't eat. They live for uh, a few, well, I think a few weeks, um, and then they they breed, and then they pass away. They eat, uh, as juveniles, they eat detritus, so they eat dead stuff in the in the stream. Uh, but yeah, again, as they, after they become an adult, they don't eat. The picture here is of an adult. <clears throat> the juveniles don't look that much different. There's a little, there's a couple things that tell them apart, but don't worry about that. Then we have Cyprinoformes. This is a large order of fish. This is a, a pretty big group that we're going to cover today. Second largest group, largest group that we're going to cover. There's another big group that we'll look at in a minute. Uh, but this group includes carps, minnows, stone rollers, dace, loaches, shiners, chubs, suckers, and more. So it's again a large order and it's diverse. We'll start off with the central stone roller. Most of what we'll cover in this group are uh, stream-dwelling fish. Uh, so central stone roller, you'll find them in the rivers and streams around here. They have a lower jaw that uh, that has a flat shelf-like extension on it that they use to scrape algae off of rocks. Um, and that's what gives them their stone roller name. They actually, that mouth is specialized for flipping over stones and uh, eating the algae on the bottom. They're uh, excellent bait for bass, bass and other game fish. So this is a really good bait fish. Uh, you don't buy it at the bait store or anything. You got to catch it and use it as bait, but you can do that. They require flowing water for spawning. So they've got to be in a river. Uh, some ID tricks. They've got a dark line through their dorsal fins. You see this black line here, uh, as well as some orange uh, below that. There's also a dark ring that follows the gill flap. You can kind of see in these pictures this darker uh, kind of semicircle on the, on the rear edge of the gill flap. The fins can also be bright orange, just like the, uh, 
the um, dorsal fin, so so can some of the um, the pectoral, the caudal, and even the um, the pelvic and the anal fins can be a little bit orange. Uh, males develop what we call braiding tubercles on their head during spawning season. That's these lumps that are on their head. So that's how you'll know that's a male and he's in, he's ready to breed is what that means. They're ready for spawning when they look like that. That's the central stone roller. Uh, you might compare, uh, confuse it with a few of the chubs that we'll look at here in a minute. Uh, we're going to look at creek chub and river chub. Um, but again, look for that orange in the dorsal other fins to know you're looking at a stone roller as well as the mouth if you have a live specimen that that shelf like jaw extension is really obvious easier one to identify the rosy side dace it's most commonly identified by its reddish pink side this is another one that's a good bait fish um, a lot of the fish in the stream will like to eat dace they're they're fairly small they don't get really big uh, the rosy side dace has a pointed, what we call terminal mouth, meaning the body and the mouth end kind of right in the middle, or the mouth ends right in the middle of the body. It's ter Everything terminates at the mouth, so it's a terminal mouth. It's got this big reddish streak on it. That's really obvious. You shouldn't confuse that with much else that we're going to have on this list. Um, there's another... Uh, a couple of dates that we'll look at here in a minute, but they don't look very similar to this. There might be some shiners that look similar, but uh, we'll look at those and tell you how to distinguish. Uh, then the river chub. So we've got two chubs, the river chub and the creek chub. Uh, the river chub is uh, dark olive above, dusky yellow below, and it will have some orange or red in the fins. It's got large scales. Slightly subterminal mouth, meaning that the mouth is uh, facing kind of down. And uh, and they'll also develop these uh, breeding tubercles on their head when they're in breeding season. Uh, this this species has a small barbel, which would be, if you're thinking about the whiskers on a catfish, that's a barbel. Uh, river chubs have a really small one that you can't really make out in the pictures. Sometimes we call them horny heads because of these, these tubercles that they develop. They look really uh, spiky and almost like horns. Uh, these are important for prey for other fish. They're also used for bait fish by, seek, by fishermen seeking large game fish like bass and catfish. Uh, this is a good fish for uh, monitoring streams as well because they are intolerant of pollution, turbidity, and siltation, and they require a minimum pH of 6. So you can, if you don't have this species in your stream, you can make some assumptions about maybe your stream's not all that clean. Um, maybe the pH is messed up. If you do have this fish in your stream, you can assume that you're looking at a fairly clean stream and that the pH is somewhere around six or at least six. So you can, just by having the fish in the stream, you can make some assumptions about the stream itself. Uh, let's see here. The breeding male builds a pebble nest that is usually close to the bank of the stream, usually in an area of low or moderate current. Uh, and they use these swollen heads. You can see the head swells real big during breeding season. They'll use that to fight off rivals uh, from their nests. So they'll actually bang each other around with those head, those big old heads. And then compare that to a creek chub which is similar to the river chub, but doesn't have quite as uh, large a head. Um, and also you can look at the dorsal uh, fin and the tail fin and notice these black spots. So there's a black spot here. You can see it on the drawing as well. And then one just right at the base of the what we call the caudal fin or the tail fin. There's a little black smudge in there too. So that's a good way to know creek chub versus river chub. You won't see that black spot, at least in the dorsal fin of the river chub. You may see a little bit of a black spot in that caudal fin, uh, but you should not see a big streak in the dorsal fin like you do on creek. Creek chubs are found in small pools and uh, small brooks and streams, so a little bit smaller bodies of water than the river chub. Their names kind of hint at that river versus creek. Whitetail shiner, 
Uh, this is a fun one because it doesn't have many distinguishing marks on it. It's just kind of all silverish. A uh, little bit of an olive green on the back, more silver towards the middle, maybe even a little bluish. Um, the key for a white tail shiner are these white uh, triangles, I guess you could call them, or they look more like triangles in this picture. But this, these white sections of the tail, what we call the caudal peduncle, that's this area right before the, the tail. You'll notice the white patches above and below where that caudal peduncle stretches into the tail. That's a good ID characteristic for white tail shiner. Um, also, they've got a chain-like scale pattern. You can really make that out here in the drawing. That's pretty good in the picture, too. Kind of look like chain, like chain link fence. Uh, this species is found predominantly in uh, in the south, so Alabama, North Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, and Virginia are the only places you find the white tail shiners. Their pectoral fins could be a little bit pink, maybe even a little bit orange, depends on the individual. Uh, this species deposited deposits its eggs in crevices of rocks and sometimes woody debris, so that's a good reason to have, you know, structure on the bottom of your stream. Then here's our other uh, kind of orangish, reddish fish. Um, so we had rosy side dace. Don't confuse it with Tennessee shiner. Tennessee shiner is much more orange. Uh, they've got a black rectangle on their caudal, caudal fin. So if you notice this black spot and it's rectangular shaped, we're going to see another one here in a minute. It's got a black spot, but it's triangle shaped. So the black rectangle, that's a Tennessee shiner. When they're in breeding, um coloration they're very orange or reddish non-breeding is is not much orange at all actually uh, spawning for this species occurs in small pools where the males are briefly visited by the females they spawn and then the females leave they occasionally spawn over a nest of other species like the river chub Then we compare Tennessee Shiner to Mirror Shiner, which won't ever show any that bright orange color. So we, their breeding uh, coloration is not orange. It's pretty just, they kind of just stay this silver color all the time. They get a little more bluish purple when they're breeding. Um, and their fins turn a little bit more, uh, I think it's pinkish. Um, but the key for Mirror Shiner versus Tennessee Shiner Number one, mirror shiner's got a little bit more of a rounded head. So if you look at the front of the head, it's kind of rounded versus Tennessee shiner's a little more pointed. Again, Tennessee shiner, when they're breeding, they're going to be orange. Mirror shiner's will never be orange. Mirror shiner's have a black triangle on their tail. Instead of a square or a rectangle, they've got a triangle. Uh, the red-orange coloration for the breeding males will only be in the fins. So this one here is maybe a breeding male. He's got this reddish-orange coloration in his fins. But you'll not see that in the body like you do on the Tennessee shiner. So again, it's just a comparison. Uh, let's see here. Mirror shiners have a slender body and a broad head. The lateral line consists of iridescent scales that reflect bluish or green when they move. The lateral line is this this line here, and it's their sense organ, so they can actually sense vibrations in the water, changes in uh, pressure to the water. They can know what's moving around based on this lateral line. You can kind of see it on this one, not as well. This one, you can really see it real good. It's this little line right here is the lateral line. So that's actually their sense organ. Uh, let's see, they're a species of concern in South Carolina, but they're stable in other parts of their range. They like to live in clear, cool water streams uh, and rivers with uh, moderate to high gradients. And they're generally found in slower moving areas of those streams, like the pools, riffles, and the slower runs. <clears throat> the thing you, the fish you might confuse mirror shiner with is telescope shiner. They're both just kind of silverish. Telescope shiners don't usually develop that reddish-orange color in their fins when they're breeding. They kind of always just silverish like this. Telescope shiners get their name because they have a really big eye. 
You see how big that eye is compared to their head. Compare that back to a mirror shiner, which has kind of a big eye, but it's not as big as the telescope shiner. Just look at it compared to how much room on the head that eye takes up on the telescope shiner. Uh, the lateral scales have a dark margin followed by a light margin and then dark again. That makes it look like they have a perforated lateral line. So if you look at this one in particular, you can see the lateral line really well. It looks perforated. It looks like a dotted line as opposed to a solid line. <clears throat> also, the back, when you're looking down on them, the uh, former instructor here said they have dragon-like scales. So maybe that looks kind of dragon-like to you on the back of that fish. If it does, great. Use it. If not, use something else. They don't have any sort of pattern or markings on their fins, so that in itself is a little bit of an ID characteristic. You'll find this species in cooler waters with uh, like quick-moving streams and small rivers, and they're primarily found only in the southeastern United States. So it's a purely southeastern fish. Next up, a shiner that's pretty easy to identify, the war paint shiner. So again, all these shiners are really good bait fish. Um, the war paint shiner is uh, one of the prettier shiners. It's got these red and black uh, markings on it. Looks like it's painted up for war um, or got war paint on. So you have this white stripe or red stripe, excuse me, through the head, followed by a black stripe right behind the gills. And then you'll have red in the dorsal fin as well as black. And you'll have black in the tail fin. That's the war paint shiner. Uh, orange, white, black color pattern on dorsal fin as well as orange stripes on the face. That's the key indicators. Deeply forked caudal fin with black outline along the edges. This species inhabits uh, moderate to high gradient creeks, streams, and rivers with clear, cool water where they feed on aquatic insects. You'll notice most of these require clear, cool water. So that's important for water quality. Uh, spawning occurs in those clear running water over a circular nest that's constructed next to a river chub's nest. Usually that spawning takes place in May and June. And each spawning can result to 300 to 1600 offspring. So war paint shiners uh, reproduce prolifically. The adults are a pelagic freshwater fish. Pelagic means they're out in the open water and it's fresh water. So you would assume that that would mean that the adult war paint shiners are kind of out, like out in the middle of the lake would be a good place to find war paint shiners out in the open water. All right, then we got our couple of dates to add on here. So we did the rosy rosy side dace which had all that red on the side of it the other two dace don't have much red on them at all the black nose dace has this black line that goes all the way through the body all the way to the nose and even around the nose and down the other side uh, so it gives it a black nose in other words that's where the name comes from black nose dace uh, another thing you could look for is the eye diameter is larger then the distance from the tip of the snout to the lower jaw. So tip of the snout to the lower jaw right here, the eye diameter is larger than that, than that distance. Uh, and that's important when we compare it to the long nose here in a minute. Uh, it's got a light brown dorsal side with this dark lateral line. And then uh, the bottom is lighter white colored almost and it may have some spots some darker spots in places uh, breeding males will develop orange on their lateral line so you can see this orange stripe right above the lateral line here that's a breeding male this this fish inhabits headwaters creeks and small rivers with swift moving water so we compare the black nose dace to the long nose dace, which doesn't really have much of a black stripe on the side. It's got a little bit of a black stripe on the face and the nose, but that, that stripe does not go all the way around the nose and continue down the other side. It's broken right here. The, the stripe stops like right there. 
The snout protrudes past the mouth, so the nose is hanging out here um, by quite a bit. This is this species is often mistaken for a sucker fish because of its fleshy projections on its mouth. Um, but it doesn't, it's not a sucker. They don't actually sucker on anything. Uh, they're olive overall. They've got a kind of an olive coloration with what we call a dark brown modeling. So just these like flecks of dark brown mixed in with a lighter background. They have a small lateral line that's often silver or yellowish in color. You can see it in the drawing pretty well. Uh, oh, this, you can see it in this picture as well. A little bit on this one, this kind of lighter color line here. That's their lateral line. <clears throat> the eye diameter is less than or equal to the distance from the snout to the lower jaw. And they inhabit the bottom of fast flowing streams and they'll usually be found among the stones or big rocks in those fast flowing streams. So one that looks like a sucker to some actual sucker fish. We have the white sucker. We're still in the same order here. Um, but uh, white sucker and northern hog sucker are the two we'll cover out of this group. There's several other sucker fish. There's several other shiners and dace that we're not going to cover. But well, this is just kind of an intro to fish thing. You'll have a lot more when you get to ichthyology. We'll add several species. But the white sucker, this uh, it's mainly kind of this goldish, whitish color. It's like a lighter color. Not quite white, uh, but it's more like a tan. Um, the big ID characteristics on white sucker is that the scales move from small to large, heading from... Uh, from the tail towards the head. So at the tail, you'll have larger scales. At the head, you'll have smaller scales. You can really see that here in the picture that's drawn, but you can also kind of make that out in the photographs. You got larger scales back here, smaller scales this direction. So you can see how they get smaller as they move towards the head. Uh, white suckers have a long round body. Like if you took them and you looked at them this direction, you would see they're almost completely round. Uh, dark green or gray or copper or brown or maybe back black on the back and sides with a white belly. So there's quite a bit of dark coloration on the back. And that could be brown. It could be black. It could be copper or gray or green. But as you move towards the belly, they get very light color, pale colored. They, they can get pretty big, 12 to 20 inches and weigh two to six pounds. That's a pretty big sucker fish. Spawning occurs in shallow water or in streams during April or May. It may be initiated by temperature changes, changes and runoff from early snow melt. So you can imagine how climate change will affect the spawning times of white sucker. Fossils from this fish in the United States occur as early as the Pleistocene epoch, which is 1.8 million years ago. So this fish has been living in the streams of, of eastern North America for at least 1.8 million years. <clears throat> and then our other sucker that we have here is the northern hog sucker. Uh, the northern hog sucker has this mottled coloration, so it's just a mix of dark and light brown uh, down the entire body. It may have these saddles, a few saddles, which are these these darker stripes that kind of go over the back of the fish. You can really see them in the drawing, uh, but there's a few on that picture as well. The modeling is present on all fins except for the anal fin. So this is the anal fin here. All the rest of the fins have this mix of dark and light brown coloration on them. Uh, northern hog su suckers are susceptible to man-made disturbances such as channelization, sedimentation, pollution, and dam construction. They feed by scraping materials off of rocks and then suck the particles up into their mouth. Uh, so sedimentation and pollution uh, or dam construction that causes those rocks to be covered in sedimentation uh, really affect this species. 
Uh, other species of fish sometimes station themselves downstream of northern hog suckers to collect the food particles that the hog sucker misses. As it scrapes this stuff off the rocks, it kind of floats away. So other fish will wait for those food particles and eat them. Spawning for this species is found to be violent and will form hollow depressions in the ground from the disturbance that the male and female make. I think, yeah, this will be, we'll finish up with this order, Scorpaniformes, and we'll do the rest of them on Wednesday. So Scorpaniformes are the sculpins and the lionfish. Uh, the only ones that we have up here in the mountains are sculpins. If you go down to the coast, uh, especially in the Gulf Coast, you'll find that lionfish are present and they are an invasive species there. Um, in fact, you could get a job collecting lionfish and getting paid for removing them from streams. You just go snorkeling all day and collect lionfish. That'd be a nice job. I don't know, you'll make a bunch of money, but you'll make some money. The model sculpin, Cotus berii. Uh, they have a large mouth, a broad head, that tapers to a slender body. They have large fan-shaped pectoral fins. You're often going to find them on the bottom of the stream. They don't use, they'll never be swimming up in the water column. They're always on the bottom substrate. Um, so they're very well camouflaged for that area. Uh, and these big, broad pectoral fins help to just kind of hold them down on the ground. Um, their body is what we call laterally compressed, so it's kind of flattened. Looks like somebody stepped on them and squished them. Uh, but again, that's just for hanging out in the rocks, camouflaging well with the rocks. Uh, they are adapted to stay on the bottom of the stream so they don't have a swim bladder, which most fish have this swim bladder in them that they can fill with air that may, and, and reduce the air in it. That'll make them go up or down in the water column. Uh, sculpins don't have that, so they just stay on the bottom. Again, uh, other adaptations for being on the bottom would be that flattened body and having those large pectoral fins to hold it down. All right, we're about five minutes early, but uh, I don't want to get into Persiformes, which is the largest order of vertebrate animals in the on the planet. So we've got quite a few Persiforms. I don't want to get halfway through and then have to stop. So we'll just, we'll do Persiformes next week or on Wednesday. We'll finish up this PowerPoint and then we'll finish up lab and that'll be about it. Let me know if you got any questions about anything. Shoot me an email if you need something.